Daniels, Karen Travers, the Property Brothers, the President of the United States, and tonight's headliner, Roy Wood Jr. But first from Los Angeles, a very special message from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hello, everybody. It's fantastic to speak to all of you here for the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Wow, what an event. Look at this. Now, I didn't come here to roast anybody or to make jokes or anything like that. I just simply wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you gathered here today. Because our country would not be the shining beacon of freedom that welcomes people like me without the free press. Let's be honest about that. And tonight's event, of course, sends a powerful message that you don't see politicians schmoozing and drinking with the press in Beijing or in Moscow and places like that. No, not at all. Here we're having a good time. Now, I wouldn't be the Arnold that you know without the press. And that's a fact. I mean, every reporter, every photographer, every editor who has brought me or my message to the people has made my life possible and successful. So even though you've asked questions that annoyed the hell out of me, I remind myself always that you're actually doing the people's work. You're the ally of the people. So never ever stop shining a light on the truth and informing the public. Ooh. I'm very proud of all of you. And it's not just me. It's also Lulu and Whiskey and, and the, my twin brother, Danny yeah. DeVito. Yeah. We're all proud of you. Give me some more of that cracker. Yeah, I come over here, I'm gonna get bit by a horse. Okay, <laughs> very nice. Okay, that's the finger. <laughs> Good okay. girl. Good girl. Thank you very much. Good. Now, speaking of questions that annoy the hell out of me, <laughs> I would like to introduce to you someone who covered me during my time as governor of the great state of California, and who's gone on to bigger and better things. Please welcome White House Correspondents Association's president, Tamara Keith. nice ring to it. Thank you, Governor, and welcome to the White House Correspondents Association Dinner. For the first time since 2016, we have both the President and the Vice President here, as well as their spouses. Their presence is a statement an endorsement of the importance of a free and independent press. Even if they don't always like the questions we ask or the way we ask them. Now, acknowledging that this is an entire evening dedicated to celebrating journalism and the White House Press Corps, I am also here to tell you that it isn't about us or the celebrities who are here, though thank you for your support. Thank you very much for your support. <laughs> As the governor said, as weird as this event is, with politicians and glamorous, famous people and totally unglamorous journalists all gathered in the same room, there is something uniquely American about the fact that we can all be here together. And then these reporters can go out on Monday and do stories about these very same politicians that pull no punches. When we're asking questions in the Oval Office, and under the wing of Air Force One, or in the briefing room, we are stand-ins for the American people. Our responsibility to the country is woven into the fabric of the nation, enshrined in the First Amendment of the Constitution. And we take that responsibility seriously. But not so seriously that we can't have a little fun tonight and laugh at a few jokes, including some at our own expense. So, Welcome to the nation's biggest celebration of the First Amendment and the important work of bringing an inquisitive spotlight to those in power. <laughs> Up first to present the WHCA Awards, please welcome ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers. Good evening. I am honored to present this year's WHCA Awards to several incredible journalists. 
some of whom are also wonderful colleagues of mine on the White House beat, journalists who bring the years of wisdom and experience, sharp insights, and tenacious reporting every day to their beats. The Aldo Beckman Award for Overall Excellence in White House Coverage is named for a former association president, the late Chicago Tribune correspondent Aldo Beckman. This year, the award goes to Matt Viser of The Washington Post. The, ju the judges said Matt Viser stood out among his competitors for work that went beyond the humdrum of covering the managed events of the presidency and the White House. Visor captured the spirit of Joe Biden, particularly with stories about the president's brother and how his Catholic faith influenced his strategic vision of the office. The WHCA is pleased to give the Aldo Beckman Award to Matt Visor. The WHCA gives out two awards for reporting under deadline pressure, one for print, another for broadcast. This year's print winner is Jeff Mason of Reuters. The, the judges said based on a tip, the judges said based on a tip and working his sources, Jeff broke the news of a White House solar initiative late on a Sunday night, hours before the administration announced it on Monday morning. The speed of Jeff's reporting had an impact on the markets and led to multiple other news outlets citing his piece before the official White House announcement the following day. Please welcome the winner of the Deadline Award for Print from Reuters, Jeff Mason. <laughs> And now the Broadcast Award. This year's winner is Phil Mattingly of CNN. <laughs> the judges said Phil Mattingly of CNN was ahead of the competition and the official White House announcement in breaking the news and the details of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's planned trip to the White House in December 2022. Phil led CNN's coverage of Zelensky's visit, including asking both Zelensky and President Biden questions at their joint press conference that elicited deeply personal and newsworthy responses. Phil's 16 live shots in a 24-hour period combine scoops, context, and depth. Take a look. Right now, planning is underway for President Zelensky to visit the White House, to meet with President Biden face to face, a visit that will coincide with the announcement of a new security assistance package, a package that will include something Zelensky has long asked for, Patriot missile systems uh, that White House officials and the Department of Defense have been weighing over the course of the last several weeks and have been moving towards signing off on. We are pleased to honor the deadline reporting of CNN's Phil Mattingly. The Award for Excellence in Presidential News Coverage by Visual Journalists this year goes to my dear friend, everybody's dear friend, Doug Mills of the New York Times. <laughs> of 
the winning photo, the judges said Doug Mills expertly captured an unscripted moment with President Joe Biden as he emerged from the shadows to celebrate the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 at an event on the South Lawn. The image is striking for its composition, symmetry, and use of light. The president's expression and posture intensify the atmosphere with a sense of gravity, as do the gazing Marine honor guards who frame him. Let's congratulate New York Times photographer Doug Mills. The WHCA partners with the University of Florida to present the Collier Prize for State Government Accountability, which is designed to encourage coverage of state government focusing on investigative and political reporting. For their series about the spectacular failures by the State Bar of California to regulate and enforce the integrity of lawyers in the state, this year the award goes to Harriet Ryan and Matt Hamilton of the Los Angeles Times. The university, the university said the series showed the bar's failure to prevent a trial attorney from using client settlement money to buy his wife's $750,000 diamond earrings and his mistress, a sitting appellate court justice, a $300,000 beachfront condo. It also showed that disbarment rates for black male lawyers are nearly four, more, nearly four times more than those of their white peers. Their reporting resulted in reforms, government investigations, increased transparency, and new legislation. Please join me in congratulating Harriet Ryan and Matt Hamilton of the Los Angeles Times. The Catherine Graham Award for Courage and Accountability, named in honor of the legendary Washington Post publisher, goes this year to Josh Gerstein and Alex Ward of Politico. The judges said Politico's efforts to report verify and publish the draft Supreme Court opinion reversing abortion rights and the organization's follow-up work exploring the consequences of the decision were globally historic and groundbreaking. It flipped the long-standing belief here in Washington, D.C. that nothing leaks from the Supremes. Here was journalism about a ruling that has had a profound and immediate impact on tens of millions of lives. Take a look. Breaking news out of Washington. Breaking new report from Politico. They have obtained a draft opinion. The Supreme Court could be poised to strike down Roe v. Wade. This is a very unusual, if not completely historically unprecedented leak. Utterly unprecedented leak. Really a stunning development. One that's likely to shape the country's social discourse. Based on our reporting information that both myself and my co-author Alex Ward obtained, it does appear it has the backing of five conservative justices. It now raises questions about the future of Roe versus Wade and what this means for abortion rights in our country. Please welcome the winners of the Katherine Graham Award from Politico, Josh Gerstein and Alex Ward.
more time for all of this year's winners. Congratulations, everyone. Please welcome to the microphone Politico White House correspondent and playbook co-author Eugene Daniels. What a beautiful evening. Hello, everyone. Obviously, there are some of us who come to this dinner very excited to get selfies with celebrities. John Legend, Chrissy Teigen, hello, you two, I'll come back later. Lisa Vanderpump and Gene Sperling. But that's not what this is about. What you are really doing here in this ballroom is funding scholarships for the next generation of the fourth estate. Over the last 10 years, Over the last 10 years, the WHCA has given out nearly $1.1 million in scholarships and leveraged another $1 million in additional aid to aspiring journalists like Julia Benbrook. In 2021, while a student at Northwestern University, she won our Deborah Oren Scholarship. Tonight, she is here as a Washington correspondent for Spectrum News. Yesterday, we had 28 of this year's scholarship recipients meeting White House correspondents Regis Jang from CBS, Zolan Cano Youngs from the New York Times, and Sabrina Siddiqui of the Wall Street Journal. They heard from Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, a strong supporter of press freedom and the daughter of a journalist. And they got an on the record briefing from Karine Jean Pierre, sitting in the seats we hope these students will someday occupy. Daisy Gonzalez Perez from San Antonio, Texas. Macy McClintock from Tampa, Florida. Claire Shiopoda from Aurora, Ohio. Grant Schwab from Wyckoff, New Jersey. Michaela Roberts from Marietta, Georgia. Annie Gentleman from St. Louis, Missouri. Ava Thompson from Chicago, Illinois. Juhi Doshi from Diamond Bar, California. Lauren Irwin from Denver, Colorado. Madeline Harden from Cleveland, Ohio. Jordan Taylor from Toledo, Ohio. Ryan Maxson from Maslin, Ohio. Anna Olson from Boone, Iowa. Lily Boudreau from New York City. Renee Romo from Sierra Vista, Arizona. Arizona. Abigail Turner from Palo, Ohio. Alicia Taylor from Kansas City, Kansas. Alexis Weiss from Pleasanton, California. Caroline Zimmerman from Kansas City, Kansas. Christina Van Wasbergen from Arlington, Texas. Abdullah Ayasun, Upper West Side, Manhattan. Brianna Alvarado from Sanford, Florida. Holly Burns from Los Angeles. Abby Ann Ramsey from Knoxville, Tennessee. Catherine Mahoney from Omni, Maryland. Rashida Anderson Abdullah from Detroit, Michigan. Eleanor McCreary from Wentzville, Missouri. Reagan Mertz from Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. Chisel Medina from Los Angeles, California. Chapman University, American University. Columbia School of Journalism. University of Missouri. George Washington University. Howard University. V. Hampton University. Northwestern University. Iowa. State University. Ohio University. University. The University of Kansas. The University of Maryland. The University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Arizona, Arizona State, State University. University. UC Berkeley's Berkeley. Graduate School of Journalism. Me and other members of the White House Press Corps spent most of yesterday with them, and let me tell you, these scholars are much more impressive than any of us were at that age. These amazing young journalists are here with us tonight. If they come to talk to you, give them a job. Now, would our students please stand up and let's give them all a round of applause. because these journalists are going to be hitting you up for scoops and jobs at all of the after parties. <laughs> Last year at this dinner, we announced the creation of a new award for lifetime career achievement as a White House correspondent, the Dunnigan Payne Prize. It was named in honor of two trailblazing women, Alice Dunnigan and Ethel Payne, the first two African-American women to serve in the White House press corps. They were also the first recipients, posthumously, of the prize that carries their name. 
Tonight, WHCA Vice President and NP New NBC News Senior White House Correspondent Kelly O'Donnell will present the prize to two journalists she worked with closely and considered great friends. Good evening. Tonight, we celebrate. Tonight, we celebrate the extraordinary careers of two journalists who are deeply missed. Gwen Eiffel of PBS NewsHour on Washington Week, who passed away in 2016, and Bill Plant of CBS News, who left us last year. The 2023 Dunnigan Payne Prize honors Gwen and Bill. Now, beyond their well-known accomplishments, let me share a couple of memories that tell us a bit about who they were. Gwen and I were colleagues at NBC News back in the 90s. I did not know her well at that time. As I was visiting DC covering my very first presidential race, I casually shared with her that I really didn't get why a campaign made certain behind the scenes moves. As Gwen was heading to her car, she stopped, turned around, and offered up her experienced and smart take on what was really going on. Now, that helped me in the moment, but she gave me something much bigger. She showed me that real pros stop, turn around, and help out. Her example made me want to be that kind of colleague. Thank you, Gwen. And Bill, more than 50 years at CBS News, was a master of the shouted question at the White House, uh, one of the president's favorites, I'm sure. <laughs> Many of us also knew Bill's gift for making presidential trips real life memories by finding time to experience the flavor of the places we visited. Around the world, he would select a perfect restaurant, the right bottle of wine, and bring together a group of us to hear his stories and share some of our own. A rooftop in Vietnam hearing about his war coverage was exceptional. What a memory. He encouraged us to savor the journey of this job. Thank you, Bill. Gwen and Bill were gracious and generous. John Dickerson of CBS News shows us how their tremendous careers leave a legacy of excellence. How do you do? My name is Bill Plant, and I'd like to show you some of my work. For 52 years at CBS News, Bill Plant showed us his work, covering the civil rights struggle. Is this the, the grand climax? The Vietnam War. Bill Plant, CBS News, BNY. And Presidents Reagan, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. Mr. President, do you believe Osama bin Laden's denial that he had anything to do with this? Bill's approach was simple. Ask direct questions and keep your opinion out of it. Did you make a mistake in sending arms to Tehran, sir? No, and I'm not taking any more questions. His baritone encased the best of accountability journalism from his front row seat to history, even when getting to that seat required a climb. That was very impressive. <laughs> or when he wasn't in it. Bill Plant? No, Bill's not here. That's shocking. Bill was beloved around the halls of CBS News, collaborative, generous in spirit, and with spirits. <laughs> On the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday... Mr. President, why is there such a disparity in the way blacks and whites see race relations? Bill conducted his final presidential interview, steps from the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a place where he'd witnessed the march to Montgomery a half a century earlier at a time when a black president seemed impossible. A white newsman, Bill Plant, who covered the marches then and who is with us here today, quipped that the growing number of white people lowered the quality of the singing. <laughs> Gwen Eiffel, a preacher's daughter, came of age in the civil rights era. Her journalism career began at a Boston newspaper. I came to work as an intern and found a racial slur directed at me at my, new, at my workspace. And instead of getting insulted and suing, I just hung in there. And we're lucky she did. 
Her talent took her to the Baltimore Evening Sun, Washington Post, and New York Times, what? where she covered the Clinton White House. How do you address those two things? From NBC News. Then television came calling. First, NBC. Bob Dole really does have a good argument to make about how his tax cut will help women. Then, in 1999, to the PBS NewsHour and Washington Week. She became the first black woman moderator of a national public affairs show. Gwen was also admired for incisive questions and thorough preparation, skills she brought to the PBS NewsHour anchor desk as one half of the first all-female network news team. Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. And I'm Gwen Eiffel. She moderated a pair of vice presidential debates and tangled with presidents, too. I always appreciated Gwen's reporting, even when I was at the receiving end of one of her tough and thorough interviews. In a city so often defined by cold power and its abuse, Gwen Eiffel shared what she had achieved, turning her smile to light the way for those she could help. She was often a first, but she made sure she wasn't the only. Promise to care about more than yourself to affect the lives of those around you. Tonight, we honor Bill Plant and Gwen Ivo posthumously with the Dunnigan Payne Prize for Lifetime Career Achievement. What a remarkable legacy. And accepting the Dunnigan Payne Prize on Bill's behalf is his son, Chris Plant. And for Gwen, please welcome her brother, Bert Isaac. lucky are we to have their example, their record of accomplishment, and everything that they leave us to inspire us going forward. Dunnigan Payne Prize. Thank you all so much. Gwen and Bill truly were the best of the best. When I was a teenager, my parents showed me a movie that opened my eyes to the possibilities that I didn't even really know existed. We were living in Hanford, California, which is a smallish town in California's Central Valley surrounded by dairies and cotton fields and orchards. Uh, but this movie, it transported me across the country. It was about a hard-charging TV producer with a clarity of purpose and a really strong feelings about how journalism should be. It took me to Washington, D.C., where news was life and the stakes were always high. The movie was broadcast news. <laughs> And the dramatic climax takes place on the night of the White House Correspondents' Dinner with Holly Hunter as TV producer. <laughs> Holly Hunter was dressed up as TV producer Jane Craig and she wears this fancy strapless gown, black with white polka dots and a big bow on the front. <laughs> As you can see, it made quite an impression. <laughs> what I saw on the screen seemed so unattainable, so very far away. Many of the journalists here in this room started at small local papers like the Hanford Sentinel or TV stations in tiny markets or niche industry newsletters. And through hard work and determination and pure luck, we wound up here with jobs that rule our lives, 
doing stories about immigration policy one day, unidentified flying objects that are definitely not aliens the next, and then following up on baby formula shortages the day after that. What I'm saying is this is the most high profile general assignment beat in all of journalism. As president of the White House Correspondents Association, it is my job to try to make it easier for everyone else in the press corps to do their jobs. That is, to report on the President of the United States, to shine a light, hold the administration accountable, and share our reporting with the world. And this is never more important than when the President goes to a war zone. When President Biden decided to make a clandestine visit to Kyiv, I made the call to Sabrina Siddiqui of the Wall Street Journal. I asked her to drop everything and come to the White House. She asked if she was in trouble. <laughs> and if this had been a movie, I would have said, no, but you're about to get the assignment of a lifetime. <laughs> but this wasn't a movie, and what I told her wasn't nearly as dramatic. She and Evan Vucci, a photographer with the Associated Press, were getting the assignment of a lifetime, though. They would be the only two journalists traveling with President Biden to Ukraine. Neither of them hesitated. White House journalists go where the president goes, wherever that may be, whether it's Wilmington, again, <laughs> or a 20-hour round-trip train ride through the Ukrainian countryside to spend five hours in Kyiv. But Sabrina had a question. Remember what I said about jobs ruling our lives? Well, Sabrina was just back from maternity leave and was still nursing. How would she pump? Luckily, I had an answer. <laughs> I had started the wheels turning days earlier to make sure that the security and logistics arrangements were in place that so that she could do both of her jobs. Not only did Sabrina write beautifully written pool reports with details that served the entire press corps and the entire country. She was able to bring milk back for baby Sophia. People often ask which TV show about the White House is the most accurate. And I'm here to tell you it's a lot more like Veep than West Wing. <laughs> However, if you were to wander into the area where the press corps works, it's more like the office meets hoarders. <laughs> the press workspace is cramped and the furniture is literally falling apart. The briefing room seats are mysteriously sticky. We have this room that we affectionately call the lavateria. That is a combo lunchroom bathroom. And the last time any of this was updated was when George W. Bush was president. But I'm happy to report that thanks to the hard work of the WHC, WHCA board and contributions from news organizations in this room, we are about to get a refresh. <laughs> yes, you are cheering for furniture. <laughs> The work to remodel the press workspace will be done in the next two months, but before we start demolition, I thought we'd bring in a couple of home renovation experts for a consultation. This is Joe and Jill. After years of long commutes to work, they finally decided to take the leap and move into their dream home. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a fixer-upper to put it nicely, but we've got some big ideas to give the White House press area a big refresh. This is so exciting, a press room refresh. This is fantastic. I cannot wait to hear these ideas. We are really great fans of your work. This place is in really serious disrepair. I mean, it's dirty, it's dingy, it's moldy. We get it. It's a shit hole. So what are you thinking? Because it can't be too out there. Originally, we wanted to hire Martha Stewart, but she wanted to build a lake and put 24 swans in it. We are pitching replacing all the furniture in the White House workspace. New cabinets, new flooring, new lighting, everything to give it a new modern positive vibe. Tasteful, simple, and within your budget. Sounds good. 
There are a few other ideas we'd like to get your approval on as well. We're only supposed to be doing the press room. We've been doing this a long time, and we think we know how to turn the White House into the White Home, and that's by personalizing it. We've commissioned Doug Mills from the New York Times to shoot some tasteful nudes of past presidents that we can display along the walls throughout the space. I, I don't think this is going to fly. Okay, okay, let's move on to the next idea because you are gonna love it. We take the entire West Wing down to the studs, get rid of all those ugly offices, and create one massive sleek modern room. Then we bulldoze the Rose Garden, lose the West Colonnade, and transform the Oval Office into a Dave and Buster's. How fun would that be? Fun. Oh, interesting. Your host has ended the meeting. Nailed it. <laughs> Hey, Martha. I knew you'd come crawling back. They always do. <laughs> Drew and Jonathan Scott are here tonight. So if anyone here is... <laughs> if anyone here is looking to replace their bathtub with a pinball machine, go find them over there. I share these moments with you this evening to remind everyone, even ourselves as journalists, that we are human beings doing a job, an important job to the best of our abilities. And some days are better than others. We seek to open eyes, change lives, and change minds. And when we're at our best, our stories bring accountability to those in power. This is a challenging time for the news industry. My employer, NPR, just went through a painful round of layoffs, and we aren't alone. ABC, BuzzFeed, CBS, CNN, Gannett, Insider, Vice News Tonight, The Washington Post, I had to alphabetize the list, it is so long. And it is hitting local newsrooms, too. WHCA member Jonathan Salant was the last newspaper reporter based in Washington dedicated to covering the New Jersey congressional delegation. And then the star ledger of Newark laid him off. You might imagine that the politicians from that state would be breathing easier. Instead, many of them protested because they know that the citizens of New Jersey need that journalistic spotlight on their elected leaders. But I'm here to report some good news. Jonathan was recently scooped up by a newspaper in Pittsburgh. So, Pennsylvania lawmakers, watch out. But the threats to an independent press aren't just financial. Our thoughts tonight are with Evan Gershkovich, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He's in prison. Evan is in prison tonight in Russia on fake espionage charges simply for doing his job, reporting. He loves blaring Russian rock music and, as the son of Russian immigrants, loves reporting stories about Russia, not just about its leaders, but about regular people, too. And his family is here tonight. Kyle, Danielle, and Anthony, we stand with you and we stand with Evan. Deborah Tice is here as well, seated with the Washington Post. Right, right over there, Deborah. Austin Tice 
a freelance journalist, was taken captive in Syria almost 11 years ago. Mrs. Tice, you were here at last year's dinner pressing Austin's case. And unfortunately, he is still in Syria a year later. Let's bring him home. Evan and Austin are among the hundreds of journalists, too many to name, wrongfully detained in countries where there is no such thing as a free press. The threats also come from within. There are reporters in this room who have been derided by the people within their own organization, dismissed as the journalists for reporting the facts, for telling people the truth, as if that's a bad thing. It isn't. This is also a challenging time for our country. People are choosing their news in part based on what they want to hear. And this makes us all vulnerable to conspiracy theories, to seeing the worst in our fellow citizens, to losing sight of our shared humanity. Despite the fact that you see us all sitting here together on this stage, the relationship between presidents and the press who cover them is never easy, ever. Every president privately and sometimes publicly bridles at his news coverage. And yet, they invite us in and take our questions. Though, sir, maybe not as many as we would like. <laughs> because we represent the American people and the constitutionally enshrined principle of a free and independent press. So as, di as difficult as the relationship between us may be, the alternative, where there is no relationship, no free press and no scrutiny, should be unthinkable for us all. There is a tradition at this dinner to acknowledge the journalists in the room, the ones who are doing the work that this night is all about. These are difficult times in our industry. There is a lot of uncertainty and fear for what the future holds, but we are still here, so let's stand proud. If you're a journalist who covers the White House, please stand up. Newspaper, please stand up. If you work in local or regional television, please stand up. Stay standing, guys. If you work for a major national newspaper or wire service, please stand. TV correspondents, anchors, producers, crew, stand up. If you support the work that all of us are doing, if you believe in a free press, if you believe it is a pillar of democracy, if you defend the power to ask questions, to open eyes, to change lives and change minds, please stand. And now, raise a glass as we proudly continue our tradition of raising a glass and toast to the First Amendment and to the President of the United States. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, President Joe Biden. Thank you, Tam, for that introduction, I think. <laughs> Let me start on a serious note. Jill, Kamala, Doug, and I, members of our administration, are here to send a message to the country and, quite frankly, to the world. The free press is a pillar, maybe the pillar, of a free society, not the enemy. Thomas Jefferson wrote, you all know this quote. Thomas Jefferson wrote, We're left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers 
or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate to prefer the latter. <laughs> to Evan's parents, Ella, Mikhail, and sister Danielle, as I've told you in person, we, not just me, we all stand with you. Evan went to report in Russia to shed light on the darkness that you all escaped from years ago. Absolute courage. A handwritten letter from prison to his family, Evan wrote, quote, I am not losing hope. In an interview, his mom, Ella, said, one of the American qualities that we absorbed is to be optimistic. That's where we stand right now. To the entire family, everyone in this hall stands with you. We're working every day to secure his release, looking at opportunities and tools to bring him home. We keep the faith. We also keep the faith for Austin, Austin Tice. His mom, Deborah, is here tonight. She knows from our several conversations, the conversations with me and my senior staff, we are not giving up. As I told you at this dinner last year, as I told you in the Oval Office, you raised an incredible son. When he was a kid, he was an Eagle Scout, a big brother, a born protector, a U.S. Marine, three tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Austin. Austin was a fearless journalist and a future lawyer. As a consequence of Austin showing the world the cost of war, he's been detained in Syria for nearly 11 years. It's simply wrong, it's outrageous, and we are not ceasing our effort to get him, find him, and bring him home. Tonight, our message is this. Journalism is not a crime. Evan and Austin should be released immediately, along with every other American held hostage or wrongfully detained abroad. <laughs> Paul Whelan, unjustly held in Russia for more than four years, whose brave sister I've met with and whose family has never quit fighting for Paul, and I promise you, neither will I and neither will this administration until we get him home. And there are other Americans being unjustly held in Iran, Venezuela, China, and elsewhere. Their stories may not make headlines or hashtags, but every day, every day, their family looks at that empty chair at the kitchen table. Birthdays, anniversaries, holidays without them, the pain of living in limbo, in a sense, is almost worse than the pain of having lost a child and looking at an empty chair. The stress of not knowing, the sorrow of uncertainty. But I want them and their families to know, Jill and I understand. We see them. They are not forgotten. And I promise you, I am working like hell to get them home. As a nation, we'll never give up on hope. Things can get better. Things can turn. Things can change. Tonight, unlike last year, Brittany Griner's here with her wife, Cheryl. Brittany, where are you, kid? Stand up. Come on. I love this woman. Love you, Brittany. This time last year, we were praying for you, Brittany, hoping you knew how hard all of us were fighting for your release. It's great to have you home. And boys, I can hardly wait to see you back on the court, kids. Remember your promise, I get to bring my granddaughter, my all-state girl, to see you, right? Because of our unrelenting efforts, 
We've been able to bring home dozens of hostages and wrongfully detainees, to wrongful detainees from Afghanistan, Burma, Haiti, Iran, Rwanda, Venezuela, across West Africa, around the world. But we're doing everything we can to prevent these cases from occurring in the first place. For example, the State Department added the threat of detention as a new risk indicator to its travel advisories. To go along with the threat of kidnapping, to warn Americans where these threats are highest abroad. I also recently signed an executive order increasing the consequences for criminal groups and terrorists who engage in the appalling practice of treating human beings as bargaining chips, political pawns. Just two days ago, my administration announced the first sanctions under this new authority, punishing individuals in the security services in Russia and Iran been part of the wrongful defense detention of Americans. Above all, across government, experts are working day and night to bring our fellow Americans home, much of which, as you well know, we can't talk about. Concern that will backfire. But my commitment, my commitment is to bring them home, just as I know your commitment is to continue to be in a free and fearless press. And that's what we honor tonight. And this is not hyperbole. You make it possible. You make it possible for ordinary citizens to question authority, and yes, even to laugh at authority without fear or intimidation. That's what makes this nation strong. So tonight, let us show ourselves in the world our strength, not just by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. Folks, I know a lot's changed in the press. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of you. This is not your father's press from 20 years ago. No, I'm serious, and you all know it better than I do. But still, it is absolutely consequential and essential. After all, I believe in the First Amendment, not just because my good friend Jimmy Madison wrote it, In a lot of ways, this dinner sums up my first two years in office. I'll talk for 10 minutes, take zero questions, and cheerfully walk away. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just announced my re-election campaign. Some of you, some of you scooped that I'd announced in the video. But really, you really all thought in your heart that I just blurted out, didn't you? <laughs> we <We'll> try. <laughs> and look, I get that age is completely reasonable issue. It's in everybody's mind. And everyone, by everyone, I mean the New York Times. <laughs> Headline, Biden's advanced age is a big issue. Trump's, however, is not. <laughs> Sorry, that was a New York Times pitch spot. I apologize. <laughs> I love that guy. I should do an interview with him. <laughs> you might think I don't like Rupert Murdoch. That's simply not true. How could I dislike a guy who makes me look like Harry Styles? <laughs> you call me old. I call it being seasoned. <laughs> you say I'm ancient. I say I'm wise. <laughs> you say I'm over the hill. Don Lemon would say that's a man of his prime. <laughs> Folks, it's wonderful to be back here again proving I haven't learned a damn thing. <laughs> I want everyone to have fun tonight, but please be safe. If you find yourself disoriented or confused, it's either you're drunk or Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> Pam, thank you for hosting us.
I love NPR. Because they whisper into the mic like I do. But not everybody loves NPR. Elon Musk tweeted that it should be defunded. Well, the best way to make NPR go away is for Elon Musk to buy it. <laughs> and that's more true than you think, anyway. <laughs> this dinner is one of the two great traditions in Washington. The other one is underestimating me and Kamala. Well, the truth is, we really have a record to be proud of. Vaccinated the nation, transformed the economy, earned historic legislative victories and midterm results, but the job isn't finished. I mean, it is finished for Tucker Carlson. <laughs> what are you wooing about like that? <laughs> like, you think that's not reasonable? Give me a break. Just give me a break. Look, like I often say, don't compare me to the Almighty, compare me to the alternative. <laughs> we added 12 million jobs. That's just counting the lawyers that de defended the president. <laughs> had Ron DeSantis, I had a lot of Ron DeSantis jokes ready. But Mickey, but Mickey Mouse beat the hell out of me and got there first. <laughs> Now, look, can't be too rough on the guy. After his re-election as governor, he was asked if he had a mandate. He said, hell no, I'm straight. I'm straight. I'll give you time to think that one through. You got it? Look, y'all keep reporting my approval ratings is 42 percent. But what do you — but I, I think you don't know this. Kevin McCarthy called me and asked me, Joe, what the hell's your secret? <laughs> I'm not even kidding about that one. <laughs> the Speaker's trying to claim a big win this week. But the last time Republicans voted on something this — that hapless, it took 15 tries. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Look, it's great the cable news networks are here tonight. MSNBC owned by NBC Universal. <laughs> Fox News owned by Dominion Voting Systems. Last year, your favorite Fox News reporters were able to attend because they were fully vaccinated and boosted. <laughs> this year, with that $787 million settlement, they're here because they couldn't say no to a free meal. <laughs> and hell, I'd call Fox honest, fair, and truthful, but then I could be sued for defamation. It ain't nothing compared to what they do to me. <laughs> Look, I hope the Fox News team finds this funny. My goal is to make them laugh as hard as CNN did when they read the, read the settlement. <laughs> but then again, C CNN was like, wow, they actually have $787 million? <laughs> Whoa. Folks, I go where people are. The Daily Show. Roy's a great guy. He once dubbed me the Jay-Z of Delaware. Don't let that look in your face. You did. Tonight, he asked me to keep it short, even offered me 10 bucks if I'd keep it under 10 minutes. That's a switch. A president being offered hush money.
Look, I'm going to leave the jokes to the pros, but let me conclude on a genuinely serious note. Roy was born in Birmingham, born in Birmingham Alabama. He graduated from a great HBCU, Florida A&M. He started in journalism to follow in the footsteps of his father, Roy Wood Sr., who covered the Civil Rights Movement. During Black History Month this year, I hosted the screening of the movie Till. The story of Emmett Till and his mother is a story of a family's promise and loss and a nation's reckoning with hate, violence, and abuse of power. It's a story that was seared into our memory and our conscience, the nation's conscience, when Mrs. Till insisted that an open casket for her murdered and maimed 14-year-old son be the means by which he was transported. She said, let the people see what I've seen. The reason the world saw what she saw was because of another hero in this story, the black press. That's a fact. Jet Magazine, the Chicago Defender, and other black radio and newspapers were unflinching and brave in making sure America saw what she saw. And I mean it. Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells once said, and I quote, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon the wrongs. Turn the light of truth upon the wrongs. That's the sacred view, in my view. That's the sacred charge of a free press, and I mean that. That's what someone we still miss so much, who you honored posthumously tonight, stood for, Gwen Eiffel. You know, she was among the very best we talked about at the table. She moderated my first debate for vice president and was a trusted voice for millions of Americans. Gwen understood the louder the noise, the more it's on all of us to cut through the noise to the truth. The truth matters. As I said last year at this dinner, a poison is running through our democracy and parts of the extreme press. Truth buried by lies and lies living on as truth. Lies told for profit and power. Lies of conspiracy and malice repeated over and over again, designed to generate a cycle of anger, hate, and even violence. A cycle that emboldens history to be buried books to be banned, children and families to be attacked by the state, and the rule of law and our rights and freedoms to be stripped away. And where elected representatives of the people are expelled from state houses for standing for the people. I made clear that we know in our bones, and you know it too, our democracy remains at risk. But I've also made it clear, as I've seen throughout my life, it's within our power, each and every one of us, to preserve our democracy. We can, we must, we will. I'd like to make a toast, if I had a glass. My grandfather, Ambrose Finnegan, said, if you ever make a toast without looking, you got a hold in your left hand. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding. I'm not. I'm probably the only Irish you've ever met who's never had a drink in his life. But anyway, I'd like to make a toast, seriously. At this inflection point in history, let us commit there will be a nation that will embrace light over darkness truth over lies, and finally, 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 
restore the soul of the nation. Hear, hear. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can I give you that? Yes. I'm going to uh, turn this over to Roy. Roy, the podium is yours. I'm going to be fine with your jokes, but I'm not sure about dark branding. It's all yours, pal. Thank you, Mr. President, I think. <laughs> it is now my great pleasure to introduce our headliner for the night, Roy Wood, Jr. He, he is a correspondent for The Daily Show who just had a killer week as guest host. But Roy doesn't just play a fake journalist on TV. That degree from Florida A&M University is in broadcast journalism. And while pursuing comedy, Roy spent 13 years in morning radio in Birmingham, Alabama, at the same station where his father, a pioneering radio journalist, once worked. Without further ado, let's give it up for Roy Wood, Jr. Give it up for Dark Brandon. Thank you. Right. Right. I'm happy to be here. Oh, real quick, Mr. President, I think you left some of your classified documents up here. You can get to them. Yeah. yeah, no, don't give them to him. I'll put them in a safe place. He don't know where to keep them. I'm a... happy to be here, though. Happy to be here. <laughs> very happy, very happy to be here. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here amongst our country's greatest leaders distinguished media organizations, both Property Brothers and Dr. Fauci. <laughs> if you see Fauci, take a picture with him. That's your new booster shot. <laughs> but y'all look good, though. I've been, I've been watching and looking around all night. Y'all look good. You dress nice. You got the nice threads on. You got the jewelry glistening. Look like everybody got a little piece of that settlement money from Fox News. <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that because I'm not going to have dominion on my ass. I love dominion. Matter of fact, let me just say right now, my favorite voting machine is <laughs> dominion voting machines. When I go to the polls, I make sure it is a dominion machine that I use. If your election needs the truth, put dominion in your booth. That's I ain't gonna get sued. It's three people you don't want to see in the courtroom. That's Dominion, Cardi B, or Gwyneth Paltrow. You're gonna lose. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to thank Tamara Keith and the White House Correspondents Association for having me. Thank you for that. Um, I'm well aware that not everybody in this room knows who I am, so let's just address the elephant in the room. I know what it is. Half this room think I'm Kenan Thompson. <laughs> Other half think I'm Louis Armstrong. <laughs> President Biden thinks I'm the dad of y'all family matters. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm happy to be here at this event amongst government officials who speak to MSNBC, former government officials who now work at MSNBC, <laughs> and future government officials who currently work at MSNBC. <laughs> uh, an often overlooked purpose of tonight's dinner, you know, serious business, an overlooked purpose of tonight's dinner is to award scholarships to students who have shown great achievements in journalism. That's right. 
These brave young souls are the future of the industry. And I'd like to stop right now and, con and congratulate tonight's top scholarship recipient, Arizona State senior George Santos. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, George couldn't be here tonight. He's auditioning for RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> That's my bad. That's my bad. We say good luck to you, George. And sashay away. And also, speaking of drag queens, can, can we stop with the grooming stuff? Can you stop talking about that? Drag queens are not at a school to groom your kids. Stop it. And even if they were, most of them kids gonna get shot at school. It ain't no problem. Don't groom pass legislation. Like, they boobs gonna bother me. I'm like, I'm like Mitch McConnell. I ain't got no soul. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tumultuous time in the media, though. We got layoffs everywhere. BuzzFeed News, NPR, Axios, Washington Post, ESPN. Paramount Global right now is considering offers from Byron Allen and Tyler Perry to purchase BET. That's how bad it is out there. These companies are so broke, they're giving BET back to black people. <laughs> Which, by the way, is not what we meant when we said black people wanted reparations. <laughs> we meant cash. You can give it to us in the Harriet Tubman 20s. <laughs> but tonight, we are all unified under one thing, and that's scandal. <laughs> Scandals. Scandals have been devouring careers this year. The untouchable Tucker Carlson is out of a job. Now, yeah. okay, some people celebrate it. But to Tucker's staff, I want you to know that I know what you're feeling. I work at The Daily Show, so I too have been blindsided by the sudden departure of the host of a fake news program. <laughs> Got caught up like that dude from Vanderpump Rules. <laughs> Text message stuff. I don't know what Vanderpump Rules is about. I just watched it a couple of times. My friends told me it's like BMF, but for white people. <laughs> or is that secession? No, secession is power for white people. No, Tucker Carlson is power for white people. No, that's white power. You know what? Never mind. Don't worry about that. No, don't worry about that. We got to get Tucker back on the air, Mr. President, because right now there's millions of Americans that don't even know why they hate you. <laughs> Fox claimed Dominion conspired with the Democrats to rig the election. And the Democrats should be flattered that they thought that y'all were smart enough to rig an election. <laughs> Warnock needed a runoff to be the werewolf. <laughs> but it's not over for you, Fox News. You still got bad, more bad news coming down the pipe. That Smartmatic voting machine lawsuit is coming. That's right, Smartmatic is coming for you, and they want more money than Dominion. Matter of fact, let me just say right now, my favorite voting machine <laughs> is the Smartmatic voting machine. If your election needs the truth, put Smartmatic in your booth. But I think it's fair that we should give credit where credit is due. Tucker Carlson is the first host to get fired from Fox News for something that's only partially about how he treats women. That's progress. He shattered the asshole ceiling. Speaking of assholes, Don Lemon is out of a job. Don Lemon. My dog, Don Lemon. Don Lemon released a statement saying he got fired from CNN. Then CNN released a statement saying that they offered Don a meeting. They had to part ways, because Don Lemon can't even accurately report a story about Don Lemon. <laughs> I still think that Don deserved more, CNN. That ain't how you fire somebody. It's messed up. How funny is it that you work in the news, then watch on the news that you got fired from the news? <laughs> Don Lemon is now the most obnoxious guy in the history of CNN. That's not fair. 
Even Jeffrey Tubin looking at Don Lemon like, ooh, he rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> Letting Don go was the wrong move. You shouldn't have let him go. Not this soon, CNN. First off, Don was fine when y'all was letting him drink. You shouldn't have cut off his liquor. <laughs> you don't fire your host after the first couple of scandals. Let the scandals, the scandals got to stack up. You got to get, some, you got to get ratings. Yes, Don Lemon was a diva, and he said a couple of women are raggedy in the face, but that's a promotion at Fox News. <laughs> But I ultimately understand why CNN did what they did. I get it, it's about morals. There should be no place on air for someone who speaks with wild disregard and doesn't consider the blowback to their coworkers or their company. Thankfully, CNN has taken steps in the right direction. They got rid of Don Lemon and they've now given a show to Charles Barkley. <laughs> to Charles Barkley's co-host, Gail King, we say good luck. <laughs> I think it's gonna be a good show. The whole show is gonna be Charles Barkley saying something crazy, then Gail King looking into the camera, Charles. <laughs> Charles. <laughs> Scandals. That's what connects us. So many scandals. The king of scandals, President Donald Trump. And for, for, for just for a moment, can we just all acknowledge, can we just all be honest and just say that the Trump arrest didn't hit like we thought it was gonna hit? <laughs> We're so desensitized to scandals now. That Trump arrest, it didn't do what I thought it was gonna do. The Trump arrest was like a pot brownie you ate four hours ago. <laughs> and you're like, hmm, do I feel justice? This don't feel like justice. <laughs> hmm. Let me try one of them Georgia arraignment brownies. Maybe that'll hit. <laughs> okay, that one's, that's got some kick to it. <laughs> Can't follow Trump scandals. There's too many Trump scandals to keep up with. Keeping up with Trump scandals is like watching Star Wars movies. You got to watch the third one to understand the first one. <laughs> then the, you, gotta, you can't miss the second one because it's got Easter eggs for the fifth one. Donald Trump is the only politician whose scandals got spinoffs on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> but the Trump arrest, it made everybody question what they believe. You thought you leaned one way politically, then Trump got locked up, everybody started waffling. Put Republicans between a rock and a hard place. Donald Trump got locked up, and for years, all Republicans, all y'all been saying for years, we gotta get tough on crime. Trump got arrested, we meant black crime. <laughs> Same thing with the liberals too. Liberals was all confused after Trump got arrested. We got to abolish prison. Trump got arrested, bring back Rikers. I don't know about y'all, but for me, um, the easiest scandal to follow was the Trump document scandal. That was the one that was easy to follow. It was simple. There's some stuff that's supposed to be in the White House that ain't. <laughs> and the media, y'all did y'all's job. Y'all jumped on that story. As soon as the Trump document story broke, everybody was down at Mar-a-Lago. We were reporting live from the documents, and we're gonna find them. <laughs> and then we found out Joe Biden had documents too, and it was like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Everybody got documents. Everybody got documents. Mike Pence has some documents. Oh, okay, about a, ooh, look, a Chinese spy balloon. Would you look at that? Ooh. Well done, media. Happy to be here. Very happy to be here. <laughs> if there's one person that could use a scandal, it's Ron DeSantis. That boy is just running around, just passing every controversial law he can think of, thinking that's going to activate voters. That's not how you activate voters in this country, Ron. Everybody know how you do politics. This is America. We don't pass laws. You make a promise to voters, and then you don't do it. <laughs> that's what the great leaders in this room understand. You know how to make things not happen. The only, thing, the only thing Ron DeSantis has done that I gotta give him credit for, this boy that got people riled up over stuff they can't understand. Don't nobody, they, they don't know what critical race theory is. <laughs> got these people riled up about something that they can't even define, like crypto or NFTs. 
Ask, ask any Republican that's anti-CRT. Ask any Republican trying to explain CRT. They sound like a Democrat trying to explain the charges against Trump. <laughs> it's bad, they're everywhere. We just gotta stop it, we gotta stop it. We got the files. We got files, we'll be right back. I'm Rachel Maddow, I have files. <laughs> Rachel Maddow get them files on you, it's a wrap. I think Republicans, y'all would be surprised, man, if y'all would just be real about what CRT is. You can be surprised. Some black folks might, be, might meet you halfway. But you gotta tell the truth. You can't lie to black people. Call it what it is. Anti-CRT policies are an attack on black history and an attempt to erase the contributions of black people from the history books. That's what it is. You are trying to erase black people and a lot of black people wouldn't mind some of that erasure as long as that black person is Clarence Thomas. <laughs> a billionaire named Harlan Crow is flying Clarence Thomas all over the world on unreported trips, like an Instagram model, taking Clarence <laughs> to the Maldives and the beaches and all. Pay for his mama's house, this billionaire. Pay for Clarence Thomas' mama's house. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta give it up to billionaires. Billionaires, boy, y'all, y'all are relentless. Y'all always come up with something new to buy. <laughs> like, just when you think of everything you could buy on Earth, a billionaire will come up with a new thing. Y'all buy space rockets, you bought Twitter. This man bought a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> Do you understand how rich you have to be to buy a Supreme Court, a black one, on top of that? <laughs> There's only two in stock. And Harlan Crow owns half the inventory. <laughs> we can all see Clarence Thomas, but he belongs to billionaire Harlan Crow. And that's what an NFT is. <laughs> Everybody's got some scandals, though. Despite the challenging times we live in, I look around this room and I see people that are hardworking. Many of you, I don't even think you should be working that hard. We should be inspired by the events in France. They rioted when the retirement age went up two years to 64. They rioted because they didn't want to work till 64. Meanwhile, in America, we have an 80-year-old man begging us for four more years of work. Begging, begging. <laughs> Let me finish the job. That's not a campaign slogan, that's a plea. <laughs> Let me finish it, let me finish it. I do, I do wish you the best of luck on the campaign trail, <laughs> Mr. President. Um, you got a lot of things that you're gonna have to navigate, a lot of hurdles. You've had quite a few scandals, you know? We, know. we know about the documents, we know about the laptops, but there's been no scandal more damaging than the scandal of, is Joe Biden awake? <laughs> hey, say what you want about our president, but when he wake up from that nap, work gets done. <laughs> he might doze off with his mm, infrastructure bill. <laughs> mm, mm, oh, student loan forgiveness. <laughs> Hmm, did we free Britney Ground or free Britney Ground? <laughs> but I think the most insulting scandal to fall to the feet of the Biden administration was placed at the feet of our Madam Vice President. The scandal of what does Kamala do? which is a disrespectful question. That's a disrespectful question because nobody ever asked that question of the vice president until a woman got the job. I'm gonna ask. I don't know what Mike Pence did. The only thing I know about Mike Pence is that he's really good at playing hide and seek at the Capitol. You gotta be crafty to catch Mike Pence in that Capitol, baby. He'd know all the nooks and crannies. Don't 
Don't put the camera on her on a Mike Pence joke. Don't do that. Don't be set. They trying to set you up, Madam Vice President. You see what they do? At the end of the day, as a vice president, the only thing, the only thing you got to do is just be better than Dick Cheney. <laughs> That's the bar. Just be better than Dick Cheney. They made a documentary about Dick Cheney. Now, I don't know much about the job of vice president, but I do know if they can make a documentary about your time as vice president, you vice presidented incorrectly. <laughs> and if a VP's job is really just waiting to step in to save the country in case of emergency, then the job of vice president is a perfect job for a black woman. Shouldn't be, but it is. And whatever you do accomplish, whatever you do accomplish, all they're gonna do is just give a man credit for it. Anything you do, oh, the immigration stuff, you done knocked out, you done got all this banking, and you got the internet down there, you done taken care of all this postpartum stuff, they just gonna give a man credit for what you done. By the way, Mr. President, great job at being the first woman vice president <laughs> of color. I don't even know how you did that part. Wonderful job. Happy to be here. But tonight, tonight is all about you all, the journalists, the defenders of free speech, the people who show truth to the world through different mediums, through television, through print, through radio, through whatever China let us see on TikTok. <laughs> but the industry that covers all of these scandals isn't immune to them themselves. The issue with good media is that most people can't afford that. All the essential fair and nuanced reporting, it's all stuck behind a paywall. People can't afford rent, people can't afford food, not healthy food, they can't afford an education, they damn sure can't afford to pay for the truth. Say what you want about a conspiracy theory, but at least it's affordable. <laughs> I mean, well, unless you Alex Jones, it costs you about 900 million. And I understand that we have to put the stuff behind the paywall because creating the truth is important. People can't afford the truth, but you all can't afford to go find the truth for free. The work you do as journalists is important, it's essential, it's dangerous. My father was an embedded reporter on the front lines with black platoons in Vietnam. He was in the South African Soweto riots, he covered that. <laughs> The Civil War in Rhodesia, which we know today is Zimbabwe. My father came back home and co-founded the National Black Network because he wanted to tell black stories. <laughs> so it's American Urban Radio Networks now, and they've been doing it 50 years, and that's part of what my father wanted to build, you know. And I know it was hard because, you know, black daddies love telling you when something was, was difficult. They were shooting at me, boy, I just, but, they, but I never dropped my tape recorder. <laughs> my daddy tell war stories like Brian Williams. <laughs> All right, Lester Holt didn't laugh at that one. Okay, so I don't know. <laughs> Good journalism costs, that's the truth of the matter. Good journalism costs the people, but it also costs the journalists. It could even cost you your freedom. We talked about Evan of the Wall Street Journal sitting in a Russian prison as we speak on espionage charges. Which espionage charges, by the way, that's the foreign equivalent of saying someone fits the description. Evan and hundreds of journalists, they're imprisoned all over the world simply for doing their job. And we gotta defend brave journalists. Most of the national stories in this country at some point were first a local story. And those stories are championed by reporters at outlets that many of them have now folded. And if we can't figure out a way to pay local reporters, then as a country, we're only left with that many more blind spots to where the bull is happening. You hear about all these newsrooms getting cuts. That's every article that Tamara has been sending me the last two months. It's just the new room is getting cut. We're cutting people, we're cutting budgets, but you never hear about the multi-million dollar executives reducing their salaries within these organizations. Now, how do we fix this? 
I don't know, I'm a comedian. I was just up here. <laughs> it's not my job to have the solution. That's on y'all. <laughs> but local, local reporting is very important. My mother is here tonight. And I know she's furious right now because I'm trying to put on camera, but my mother was amongst a group of black student protesters fighting for equality in the 60s at Delta State University. And, and that was a dangerous time. But those types of incidents were covered by local reporters and some of the shame that came from the national embarrassment of treating people inhumanely is part of the pressure that helped to create that type of change. What would have become of my mother and those other protesters if a local journalist wasn't there telling the story? And now it's no different. But thankfully, my mother's story was told. She got to complete her degree at Delta State and continued on to Florida A&M and got another degree. And then, for the last 45 years, has worked at a historically black college as an educator and administrator. And <laughs> one of those many black colleges that need a little bit more funding. You got a 20 on your joke. <laughs> Send that down to one of the black colleges. Uh, to my mom, I say thank you for everything you've done for me and for helping countless students in Birmingham have the opportunity to see a college degree and to see an opportunity to grow, you know. My mother's journey may not have even begun if not for brave journalists who chose to chronicle history in real time. And I don't know how to ever repay my mom for what she's done for me and what she's done for so many people in Alabama. But just know, mama, if, if a white billionaire call you and offer to buy your house, please sell it. Because <laughs> I might want to become an NFT. Thank you so much to the Correspondents Association. Thank you so much to Tamara Keith. Thank you all so much. Good night. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks again to our executive producer, Bob Bain, and his excellent team. Thank you to the Washington Hilton. Thank you to our members. And now, Kelly O'Donnell, who will take the reins as WHCA president in fewer than three months. <laughs> Kelly will escort the president of the United States and his ice cream cone dessert off of stage. <laughs> May the force be with you, Kelly, when you take over this job. <laughs> And everyone here, please remain in your seats until the President, the Vice President, the First Lady, and Second Gentleman have departed. Good night, everyone. Thank you. This has been Lakshmi Singh speaking for the White House Correspondents, Correspondents Association. Association. Thank, Thank you, and, and good night. night.
And that wraps up our coverage of this year's White House Correspondents' Dinner. If you missed any of tonight's program, it will be available to view anytime on demand using our free video app C-SPAN Now. Also there, archival speeches from past dinners. C-SPAN Now, your on-the-go app for public affairs. C-SPAN is your unfiltered view of government. We're funded by these television companies and more, including Sparklight. The greatest town on earth is the place you call home. At Sparklight, it's our home too. And right now, we're all facing our greatest challenge. That's why Sparklight is working round the clock to keep you connected. We're doing our part, so it's a little easier to do yours. Sparklight supports C-SPAN as a public service, along with these other television providers, giving you a front row seat to democracy. And now back to the beginning of the evening of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. First, the guest arrivals, followed by tonight's speaking program. 